Hello, all, and welcome. Happy early St. Patrick's Day. Um, my name is Larissa Disler, I'm the Adult Services Librarian here at the library. For anyone who doesn't know me, and I'm just going to go over a couple of quick things before we get started. Bathrooms are downstairs. Water cooler is at the top of the front steps. Um, we do have a virtual audience tonight as well as an in-person audience. So for our virtual peoples, um, please note that you cannot turn your mics on. Please leave any questions or comments in the chat and I'll get them to Tracy and Trina before the end of the program or at the end of the program. <laughs> and this program is being recorded and it'll be on our YouTube channel as long as the recording works out for two years. So I'll introduce Tracy Roberts and Katrina Terry, who are a mother and daughter duo with advanced degrees in both in history and British literature and folklore respectively. They've been performing together for over three years and I know them and like them both very much. So, <laughs> so I'll welcome them to the front here and we'll get started. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Larissa. <laughs> this is an Irish boron. It's a goatskin drum. That's very typical that you'll see this in Irish music. And Trina and I do a number of songs together where we use the boron. However, they're all in Scots, Gaelic, or they're Scottish songs. And we're trying to do all Irish tonight. <laughs> so that's all you're gonna get of the boron. So I, but I did wanna show it to you because it is kind of a great instrument. So. <laughs> Had to be shoehorned in. <laughs> the, there we go. <laughs> it got a little moment, you know, in the sunshine there. Okay, so, so I'm Tracy and this is Katrina, Trina. All right, and we're going to do a uh, Kied Falcha, which means 100,000 welcomes in Gaelic. The Irish in the old lead mine district, history and songs. So we're here to share our research about Irish immigration to the lead mine district. We have some songs for you that we hope will help illustrate the trials um, of moving from Ireland to America during the Great Migration. We're gonna talk about a period from about 1820 to about 1860. <clears throat> the Upper Mississippi Lead Mine District includes Dubuque and nearby mining areas um, in Wisconsin, but today we're mostly gonna focus on Galena, but we, that's the outline of the lead and zinc district. Immigration history is the story of people on the move. It has two components, emigration or leaving a place and immigration, the arriving to another. Immigrants don't always leave their homeland because they are poor and suffering. Some leave because they aspire to try new things, learn new skills, or be with family members who have already emigrated. However, their capabilities, financial, physical, circumstantial, all play into whether they can actually leave their homeland and go to a stranger's land. The Irish were a distinct group among many distinct groups who lived in our area. First, we have the intermigration of Native Americans to the upper Mississippi River Valley in the 18th century. Then the white trappers and traders, mostly French Canadians and Métis communities. Those are people who are French and Native American uh, groups. They arrived to this area by 18. 18, we find American Southerners who engaged in early lead mining and Eastern Yankees who soon established businesses to bring their own brand of Americanism to the frontier. An African American population came to Galena by force and by free will uh, as early as 1821. So during this period of 1820 through the 1860s, the foreign born Irish, German and British arrived in large numbers. So some of the earliest Irish immigrants uh, to come to this area left their homes not from economic necessity, um, but political necessity. Uh, at the end of the 18th century, a widespread movement of Irishmen called the United Men um, rebelled against these oppressive and often oppressive laws of the English government at that time who were controlling Ireland. 
hoping to force the cause of enfranchisement and in direct response to the arrests of many of their leaders. In 1798, the group took up arms. They made a desperate bid for freedom, but were brutally defeated um, over the course of a couple of years. Um, following the failed rebellion, even harsher restrictions were imposed both formally and informally on Catholics. Um, and anyone suspected of wishing to be free from the British crown. The Act of Union in 1800 gave Britain even greater power over Ireland. Uh, and it was made clear to the supporters of Catholic emancipation that the situation in Ireland was only going to become worse. In the wake of these events, many young Catholic men who could not bear the yoke of oppression or whose personal or family ties to the rebellion of 98 made continuing in Ireland uh, untenable, left for America. Despite the distance and the difficulties of building a new life, many of these men considered uh, America less of sort of a clean slate than they did more of a staging ground to hopefully restart uh, an Irish rebellion or the cause of freedom in Ireland. In 1909, uh, a local area man wrote about his father's arrival in the area. And so W.W. W. Murphy, whose family settled around Benton, talked about what had happened to his father following the Battle of Vinegar Hill, uh, which was sort of one of the key battles fought in 98, where the Irish were uh, defeated by the forces. So he said, the day following the battle, a troop of horsemen marched through the Murphy settlement carrying the head of my father's cousin, Owen Murphy, impaled on his own pike pole. Then an era of prescription followed and it was especially directed against the Murphys. The incidents of the battle and the subsequent prescription left a deep impression on my father. His youthful mind revolted against the tyranny to which his people were subjected and awakened thoughts of the land of the free, America. And he formed an early resolution that as soon as he was of sufficient age, he would depart from the home of his kindred and find a new home across the ocean for his father, mother, sisters, and brothers. Though the elder Murphy died in 1860, his son's vivid memories almost 50 years later are a testament to the pride and sorrow that his family felt regarding their homeland. After 1810, the English overlords in Ireland forbade the use of the Gaelic language and there were laws against Catholics. At that time, over 50% of Irish people still spoke Gaelic as their first language. The poetry and music so beautifully expressed in the Irish tongue was being destroyed. Now, sometimes people think Irish is just English spoken with a brogue. <laughs> ah, sure now, won't we be going down to the pub? Oh yes, you know, no, it's a fully different language called Gaelic. It's a part of the Celtic language group. So Trina's going to sing a traditional Irish song where the verses are in English um, or, yeah, and the chorus actually is um, in, in, in Gaelic, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And this is, you go ahead and explain yeah. it. So this song is called <laughs> Shula Roon um, and Shula Roon is my love. And this song is a young woman's lament for the young man who has left her to go try to make his fortune overseas. Um, now I am going to sing this a cappella, and that is very traditional. Um, of most early Irish music, if you were singing, there wasn't instrumentation. Um, the singer would simply stand up and present their song. Maybe I need to help um, you here. So, oh, you're gonna gonna wind me up. So this is another one time I was in a bar <laughs> deep in in the Gaeltacht, which is the Irish speaking area of Ireland, and this old man came up to an older other older man, and he said, "Come on, no, Pat, come on, go sing us the tune now, won't you?" <laughs> And no, no, I don't want to be singing now. I only had one. No, come on, Pat. You can do it. You can do it. <laughs> and so he had to be wound up, much like a toy. <laughs> so, so this is Shula Loon. Um, I wish I was on yonder hill. It's there I'd sit and cry my fill. Until my tears would turn the mill. Shula, 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 run. A shula go so get a shula go kyan. A shula go do a I'll sell my rod and I'll sell my reel. I'll sell my only spinning wheel to buy my love a sword of steel. Shula, 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 run. A shula go so get a shula go kyan. 
But now my love has gone to France to try his fortunes to advance. If e'er he returns, it's but a chance. Shoo, the shoo, the shoo, la run. A shoo, la goose, a pair of the shoo, go kyan. A shoo, go to the side, the sea, the glum. But I'll dye my petticoats, I'll dye them red. And round the world I'll beg my bread. Until my parents shall wish me dead. Shoo, shoo, the shoo, la run. A shoo, la go, so get all the shoo, go kyan. A shoo, la go, dara, sa, ka, se, le, glum. I wish, I wish, and I wish in vain. I wish I had my heart again. And vainly think I'd not complain. Shoo, shoo, the shoo, la run. A shoo, la go, so get all the shoo, go kyan. A shoo, la go, do, da, sa, be, se, le, hit, lum. E, sko, che, e, tu, ma, myo, o, ni. The Irish were one of the earliest European groups to arrive at Galena. By the early 1820s, single men and families quickly created ethnic enclaves in the lead mine district. Irishmen created their own towns and churches in the lead mine district, including at Vinegar Hill, Irish Hollow, New Diggins, Little Dublin, among others. This is a map done in 1828 by Chandler. It's a very well-known map around here. Um, it showed everything that was on the ground by 1828. So this is quite early. Um, and all those little dots are lead mines. <laughs> yes, <laughs> the place was pockmarked. The Muskoki, Sauk, and other indigenous peoples were forced to the western shore of the Mississippi after the Black Hawk War of 1832, thus ending a cruel and bloody chapter in US history. The trading settlement at La Pointe quickly transformed to the city of Galena during the 1830s. In the ensuing years, Galena experienced its zenith in population, mercantile strength, and lead ore shipments. It was also the era marked by increased ethnic visibility and institution building. The underlying economic factor for all incoming groups was the incredible need for labor. At first, mostly single men came in and out of the community as opportunity called. The stability in the community only emerged when women and families settled together in what had been a male migration into the region. Middle-class women from Eastern cities left behind good quality housing, a variety of goods to purchase, cheap household help, close familial and platonic friendships, and some status within their society. Moving to a frontier post such as Galena with its undeveloped infrastructure, primitive housing, lack of goods, and labor shortages meant a life of hard physical labor and a temporary or possibly permanent lowering of living standards. To others, however, to the women, especially those from small villages in Ireland or England, and to many women from Missouri and Southern Illinois, Galena opened opportunities for themselves and their families. Due to labor shortages here and the less structured culture, women could push the definition of women's sphere. They were part of building family enterprises on farms and in shops, and they could become teachers or business owners more easily here than in the East. A trove of new Diggins court docket books and other township records were recently saved from destruction by Jack Shannon of Benton, Wisconsin. These records are now safely stored at the Area Research Center on the campus of University of Wisconsin, Platteville. In these court records, we find mention of several Irish women in the New Diggins mining area. In 1854, an Irish born woman named Mary Ann Wallace was arrested for selling liquor without a license. 
<laughs> in court, she pled guilty, but claimed there was no, they had no right to fine her. She refused to pay the $10. In the docket book in pencil reads, nothing collected. <laughs> In 1857, Nancy Coyne was arrested for the same offense, but she paid up. In the census of 1850, a Mary Richards born in Ireland apparently housed the aforementioned Marianne Wallace and a Patrick Wallace. Mary Richards listed her occupation as minor. Now that's the only place I've ever seen a woman list in the census as minor. So it's either a mistake or she was a minor. We don't know. In May of 1856, Honora Sullivan took Mary, Mary Leary to court, claiming Mary beat her severely with a stick and threatened to do the same again. Mary offered no defense and was fined $5 plus court costs. She was put on probation for six months. Irish women in the lead mine district rarely listed in directories or in census records since they were not normally heads of household are found in typically female occupations like dressmaking or laundresses and boarding house matrons. The vast majority of Irish working women undoubtedly worked as domestic servants. The national censuses taken from 1860 on give far more detailed information about occupations. Heads of households are listed along with the names of all dependents. We find from this that 24 year old Margaret Carey from Ireland ran a drinking house in Galena, took care of two male boarders and her son Patrick age three. Her personal estate was valued at $50. Catherine Sheehan, age 29, also from Ireland, took in washing. She was mother to Patrick, age eight, Rosa, six, Ellen, three, and John, just under one. No dollar value was assigned to her estate. <clears throat> All right. You need a new slide. Uh, so in the lead mine district and Galena in particular, um, with its easy access to the wider world via the Mississippi, um, it became a hotbed for Irish Republican political action. Arriving in the mining camp in 1826, uh, John Dowling and his teenage son, Nicholas, who some of you may be aware of since Galena still has the beautiful Dowling house, um, <laughs> they helped to found the first Irish political organization in this area, which was called the Friends of Ireland in Galena and the Lead Mine District. Until the end of the 19th century, Irish political and social action was a constant and well-respected cause in this region. Besides the Dowlings, other Irishmen arrived, including uh, George Moore Mitchell, who helped to found Galena's first fire department, uh, James T. Dwyer, and Major Philip Berry. Building a new life in a strange land, these men committed themselves to both the cause of Irish freedom and to the comfort of the Irish within their own communities. They became involved in local politics and charity. Uh, John Dowling became a member of the Board of Trustees for the newly formed city of Galena, and his son Nicholas and George Mitchell were both elected to the city council after its formation in 1841. Both of them, in fact, served as mayor multiple times, um, and both were key members of the early volunteer fire department here in Galena. They were all intrinsic to the Irish movement in Galena. Uh, for men and women, leaving home for a new country was a heartbreaking event. While each individual emigre had different reasons for leaving home, similar themes are found in a lot of the songs and letters and memoirs. There was a process of leaving, the collecting of funds, you say goodbye, there's the dangerous passage um, overseas, the loneliness and isolation of the adventure and often traveling long, long distances, even beyond the initial travel. Um, and then the hope for the future um, that you can make a better life for yourself. And there are so many songs dedicated to these themes, particularly by Irish immigrants. Um, we'd like to sing an Irish immigration song written by a young man in about 1850. Uh, he left the dock uh, at Derry, uh, which is in Northern Ireland to come to America. I'm going to go on the other side of you so they can see that. This is how we're used to it anyway. I know, I, be on I know. I'm, I'm getting to the wrong side. I'm going to get us all confused. <laughs> <laughs> From Derry Cay, we sailed away on the 23rd of May. We were taken on board by a pleasant crew bound for America. Fresh water then we did take on 5,000 gallons or more. 
In case we'd run short, going to New York, far away from the Shamrock Shore. So fare thee well, sweet lies a dear, and likewise run to Derry Town. And twice farewell to my comrade boys who dwell on that sainted ground. If fortune ever should favor me and I to have money in store, I'll go back and I'll wed the wee lassie I left on Paddy's green shamrock shore. We sailed three days, we were all seasick, not a man on board was free. We were all confined unto our bunks with no one to pity poor me. No father dear, no mother kind to hold up my head it was sore, which made me think more of the lassie I left on Paddy's green shamrock shore. We safely reached the other side after 15 and 20 days. We were taken as passengers by a man who led us round six different ways. Then each of us drank our parting glass in case we might <clears throat> never meet more. And we all drank a toast to old Ireland and to Paddy's green shamrock shore. So fare thee well, sweet lies a dear, and likewise unto Derry town. And twice farewell to my comrades brave, who dwelt on that sainted ground. If fame or fortune should favor me, and I shall have money in store, I'll, I'll come back and I'll wed the wee lassie I left on Paddy's green shamrock shore. Thank you. <clears throat> The reference to being led round in six different ways refers to the so-called runners who preyed on the un unsuspecting immigrant as he emerged from the boat. The runners took advantage of the uninformed newcomers. Oh, do, do one oh. more, sorry. Oh yeah, we got the sheep. You were going to stay there. Yes. <laughs> stay on the sheepies. A staple of both Ireland and our local countryside. Yes, uh, yes. Over the course of the 19th century, three major Irish organizations were convened in Galena. The first, uh, which I already mentioned, was the Friends of Ireland in Galena and the Lead Mine District. Um, they were organized in 1828, and they held their first St. Patrick's Day gathering around 1829. Uh, while the records for the society itself have been lost, um, there are transcriptions of their speeches um, in both some books, but also local newspapers, which give us some ideas as to the aims of their organization. During the St. Patrick's Day speeches in 1829, um, one of their members made a toast to the British lion. He roared under the lash of the hickory, may he tremble in fear of the shillelagh. <laughs> Is that heavy? Dick used as a weapon by Irishmen, by the way. <laughs> Newspaper notices showed that this group remained active throughout the early years of Galena. However, what a group so far removed from their homeland could do for their country remained fairly uncertain. Um, so the organization's members seem to have focused largely on local charities at that time. Um, we know John Dowling personally um, donated $250 to the Sisters of Charity in 1837, which supported Catholic education here in Galena at the time, absolutely. And he was known for giving these large donations as well as small personal donations um, to families who were struggling after arriving here. It wasn't until the possibility of repeal reared its head, though, in the 1840s that the Irishmen of Galena really found a concrete opportunity to give their support to the Irish cause. In Ireland, there had been growing discontent with English supremacy. During the 1830s, Daniel O'Connell, who um, was an Irish independence leader, began agitating for the repeal of the Act of Union that again had happened in about 1800. Um, they wanted political autonomy and universal male suffrage in Ireland. 
by the early 1840s, that movement had grown and O'Connell was drawing huge crowds around him for speeches. The cause of repeal really began to seem possible to a lot of Irish people, both at home and abroad. Um, many hoped for a nonviolent change in governance, which this was sort of the first opportunity they'd had for something like that. In Galena, the Friends Group decided they would change their name to the Repeal Association of Galena, and they threw their whole weight behind O'Connell's cause. On August 18th, 1843, uh, the new association posted their bylaws in the Northwestern Gazette and Galena Advertiser stating, the object of the association shall be to extend to the people of Ireland such aid as may be in its power, whereby the cause of Ireland's happiness and freedom may be generally promoted. Now that sounds like a fairly tame sentiment, um, but it was expanded upon by James Dwyer um, in another newspaper notice in August of 1843 as to exactly how they were going to provide this aid. So he said, it's almost unnecessary for me to remind you repealers that the whole object of our meeting is to raise an amount of money such as will show our enemies both public and concealed that the friends of Ireland, more particularly the Irish exiles in these diggings, have the means and disposition to make up a sum of money that will be credible to them, annoying to their foes, and gratifying to their friends and relations both in this country and in Ireland. The financial support the repeal movement made was not insubstantial. Um, the remittance columns in the New York Truth Teller, which was a pro-Catholic, pro-repeal newspaper, show that the Galena Repeal Association was donating between five and six hundred dollars biannually um, to that cause. The group continued to hold St. Patrick's Day celebrations and dinners, which became more elaborate uh, with time. The Galena semi-weekly uh, advertiser in March of 1846 describes the parade as being made up of many hundreds of men uh, carrying banners and being preceded by a popular band. That night, uh, the toasts really captured the emotional state of the repealers during the hopeful years of the 1840s. Um, one man said, in his toast, to Ireland, the land of our birth, all of our early associations are there. The oppression under which she groans calls forth the sympathy of all philanthropists and her brave sons rallying under the peaceful standard of O'Connell have decreed that she must be free. A more pithy summing up of their feelings uh, was voiced by Jeremiah Daly Jr. who wished a hard trotting horse a porcupine saddle and a cobweb, a cobweb pair of breeches and a long journey to any member of parliament, not a repealer. <laughs> <laughs> the hopes for peaceful dissolution between Ireland and England, though, were dashed. Um, following the Irish Rebellion of 1848, which was a direct response to the British crackdown on the leaders of the repeal movement uh, and the Young Ireland movement, which was connected, um, the cause of Irish independence was briefly extinguished. Um, and Galena's repeal movement, well, it had continued pretty deep into the 1840s. Um, it becomes unclear after that point exactly when they chose to disband following that. Let me get my guitar, my little traveler, about the right size for a person who's five foot tall, right? <laughs> I'll change slides here. Thank you. The Irish came over with skills in maintaining their culture, even within a hostile environment. They were accustomed to guarding their religion and customs against the dominating culture. Many Irishmen started out as mining laborers, lead ore washers and haulers, and did the extremely hard work of building the rail lines as they moved westward to Illinois. This next song was written in the 1880s for the industrious Irish immigrants who worked in hard rock mining. Every morning at seven o'clock, there's 20 terriers are working at the rock. The boss comes along, says to still, come down hard on the cast iron drill and drill ye terriers drill. Drill ye terriers drill. For it's work all day for sugar and your tay down beyond the railway and drill ye terriers drill. Thank you. 
Marty Foreman is Dan McCann. I'll tell you, sure, he's a blame mean man. Last week, a premature blast went off. A mile in the air went Big Jim Goff. Oh, drill ye terriers, drill. Drill ye terriers, drill. Oh, it's work all day. Put sugar in your tea down beyond the railway. And drill ye terriers, drill. Next time payday comes around, Jim Goff was short one buck he found. What for, asked he, and this reply, you were docked for the time you were up in the sky. Oh, drill ye terriers, drill. Drill ye terriers, drill. Oh, it's work all day for sugar in your tea down beyond the railway. And drill ye terriers, drill. Drilly terriers drill, drilly terriers drill. <laughs> we'll change the slide. Irish enclaves grew up just outside the city of Galena. In this area, many Irish families quickly built businesses, owned their mines, started churches and social clubs. Vinegar Hill Township, a couple of miles north of Galena, refers to the hill in Wexford, Ireland, where the last battle of 1798 was fought against the British. Trina referred to that earlier. Jonathan Furlong developed lead mines there as early as 1823. The first store and saloon were opened by, at Vinegar Hill by Thomas Burns in 1826. At the time of township organization, the area was called Mann, M-A-N-N, -N, after an early German settler. It was reported that the Sons of the Emerald Isle, Isle were dissatisfied with that name. So they officially changed it to Vinegar Hill. <clears throat> and explaining how it came to be the new township name, a Michael Burns explained, me and Jonathan Furlong and Thomas Carroll with others, while in a state of spiritual hallucination at Burns Saloon, <laughs> christened an Indian mound near there by pouring whiskey over it and declaring that henceforth, this place shall be called Vinegar Hill. <laughs> they built a Catholic church in 1843. That's you. All right, this settlement was pocked with hundreds of badger holes or shallow mines making for an increasingly less appealing landscape. Trees were cut down by the acre to feed to the smelters that roasted the ore in order to produce the refined lead. Another Joe Davis County Irish enclave was at Irish Hollow or Rodden Station. Next slide, thank you. Um, I don't know if you know where, some of you know where that is. That's on. Long Irish <laughs> Hollow Road there, right? You know that area, most of you know that area. <clears throat> so in 1834, William Rodden settled in a remote acreage about 10 miles southeast of Galena. An emigre from County Down, Rodden established a large farm at Irish Hollow, mostly growing wheat. In religion, he was a Protestant. Enjoying the freedom from the caste system imposed by the British in Ireland, he related the following story. After the American Civil War, he visited the American consul in Holywood, his native town in Ireland. He shook hands with the ambassador like any other American without putting his hat under his arm or bending his knee. <laughs> to the great astonishment of his acquaintances in the old country. In 1860, Schulzburg, Benton, and New Diggins, mining villages in Lafayette County in southwest Wisconsin, were home to the greatest number of, of Irish-born people in the mining district. In that year, heads of households born in Ireland numbered 894 people in those three small villages, and many of those heads of households had many children and wives, and so there were a lot of people in the community. An early mining camp called Dublin was settled near present-day Schulzburg. Now, all the red lines on that map, right, just south uh, west of the actual village of Schulzburg, those are all mines. So that's what's under the ground near Schulzburg. Every red line there is an old mine. So I'm sure they must have some cave-ins around there occasionally. <laughs> yeah. So in that area, they called it Dublin. And uh, by 1828, there were 15 to 20 log and sod houses near 
what they called the Irish Diggings, a very profitable mining operation that eventually spread over 4,000 acres of ground. In the early 1830s, a Mr. Doyle developed the Irish mines, making him a very wealthy man. But according to the history of Lafayette County, Doyle made some bad business deals and indulged in excessive liquor. So he lived the remainder of his days in poverty. Oops. I'm going to change that. So Reverend Samuel Mazzacalli, a Dominican priest from Italy, was assigned to the needs of all Catholics in the Northwest Territory. In his memoirs, he wrote in July 1835, the rising city of Dubuque numbered about 250 persons, perhaps a thousand uh, with the people in the environs of the town where mining was carried on in search of lead veins. The Catholics might have numbered 200, nearly all Irish by birth. <laughs> Not a few had acquired a considerable fortune. Nevertheless, the faith, which seemed as if dulled, was not extinguished in these souls who had once imbibed Catholic principles in their homeland. Mazzucchelli laid the foundation for Dubuque's first Catholic church, uh, a stone edifice which became the first St. Raphael's. <laughs> the Irish in the region readily adopted Father Mazzucchelli and affectionately referred to him as Father Matthew Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, he was too Italian. <laughs> Mazzucchelli is credited with establishing many local parishes in the lead mine district. He also built at least 24 churches well in the United States. He was instrumental in furthering the cohesion of the growing Irish communities all over the lead mine district. In 1838, Mazzucchelli built St. Michael's, uh, which was the first Catholic church in Galena. Uh, St. Michael's Parish established a day school for boys and girls and later built Fian Hall, which housed the Annunciation School, which until recently was um, the Arts and Recreation Center on Bench Street. The Church of St. Michael's was rebuilt three times. The present building went up after the Great Fire of 1856, which raised the second one to the ground, uh, along with a lot of the other buildings in town. <laughs> Mazzucchelli ended his pastoral work at St. Patrick's Parish in Benton, Wisconsin, um, where he died of pneumonia in 1864. Today, his frame house in Benton serves as a museum to him. If you haven't been there, it's really fascinating. <laughs> That's a little hard to read, the, but that is a... Um, that drawing is, of course, if you can see those crocodile you know they've got papal uh, hats on right so the idea is they're going to come and swallow America right so it's a very anti-catholic type of and this was actually done by Thomas Nast so if you wonder where the word nasty came from now you know <laughs> yeah in the nation as a whole, a strong bias against Catholics existed, especially in the 1850s. But the Roman Catholic Church was the largest single church in America with over 3 million parishioners. It was largely an immigrant church. Due to the early arrival of Catholics with the French explorers, the Irish and the Southern German population, Galena did not experience the anti-popery sentiment as strongly as it was expressed elsewhere. The church was established early on and many of its members were prominent citizens. There were so many Catholics here that there was never, there were just never enough priests to serve the community. This anti-Catholic sentiment colored politics and social life. The temperance movement, which in itself can be viewed as a righteous cause, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> right, Terry? <laughs> Serve the nativist and the anti-papists. <laughs> the push for prohibition was a reaction against Catholic immigrants who saw no harm in Bier or Uskeba, which is the Irish word for whiskey. For them, the Sabbath day was a day to rest, to visit at the pubs and to play music. There's evidence that there were clashes between Protestants and Catholics in Galena, but there were also examples of mutual aid. When Father Mazzucchelli needed funds to put a roof on the first St. Michael's in 1838, he was grateful to receive substantial donations from the Protestants. An example of troubles between the groups appears in a report from 1852. The Galena school system adopted the use of the King James Bible in the classroom. Could have sworn we had church and state. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I'm confused about that. The mayor of Galena observed that there was, quote, a great deal of dissatisfaction among a large class of the community over school instruction. Apparently, Catholic parents were holding children back from school because of religious differences and the use of a Protestant scripture in the schools. The mayor suggested it might be better to discard the use of Bible commentaries and scriptural explanations in the public schools. 
by the late 1850s, about half the schools in Illinois did drop the use of the Bible in school lessons. Undaunted by the intolerance shown, the Irish went on to create important institutions and businesses in Galena. From the city directories of 1847 and 1854 and the county history written in 1878, we find Irish in a variety of occupations. Many Irish miners and farmers are listed, but in town, we find Irishmen running shoe stores and groceries. We find an Irish lawyer or two, and in the political arena, Irish councilmen. We find Irish barkeeps and a large number of laborers, railroad men, and masons. While the Irish politicians and business owners often lived in grand houses scattered throughout Galena, many low-paid workers lived in the very poor and unfit shirt tail row near the railroad. Now, I have a photo of shirt tail row, but I couldn't find it. But this is kind of close. So this would have been on the west side of the river. But it, you know how there's a floodplain at our river. And shirt tail row is on the west shore of the Galena. Or no, the east shore east. of the Galena. So it would have been right about there, but further up, further that way. And so it's, it's in the floodplain. So your house is getting flooded occasionally. You know, you're in the mud. It would have been near the current bottom of Booth Hillier Street. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. There was a railroad that went through their course in the 1850s, and that offered more noise and soot than probably could be tolerated. So... During the Civil War, uh, the Irish fought bravely, joining a Galena regiment known as the Ryan Guards, uh, named after William and James Ryan, Irish-American brothers who came to Galena in 1846. The Guards were part of the 90th Regiment Company B. They fought in over 20 battles during the Civil War, uh, and the Ryan brothers built a large pork packing operation here in Galena and, of course, built the Ryan Mansion, which you have probably all seen, which is very beautiful. We have a slide of that, in yeah. fact. And, in fact, if we could... <clears throat> Perfect. There we are. <laughs> um, and because of their pork packing operation and William's friendship with Ulysses S. Grant, uh, it ensured large orders of barrel pork for the troops, making the Ryan brothers very wealthy. <laughs> James and his family remained in Galena while William moved his family to Dubuque and opened another large pork, uh, blah, blah, pork packaging plant there, trying saying that five times fast. And as the century progressed, the Irish populations incorporated their American-born children into their movements and continued to care for their communities here in the lead mine district. In 1873, the Irish Benevolent Society was formed. The aims were local, offering assistance with medical care and burial expenses for the Irish of Galena. They continued to keep up the St. Patrick's Day tradition for some years, um, though we do start losing really any evidence of them um, starting at about 1897. Although the focus had shifted to the local population, uh, the old Republican spirit uh, in Ireland had not died. The continuing passion for the Irish cause and the desire to pass on to their children their unwavering devotion to Ireland remained. This is perhaps best illustrated by Louis Schistler, um, whose St. Patrick's Day speech was recorded in the Galena Gazette in 1875. He declared that should you question any Irish immigrant how he intends to raise his children, he intends to instill in the mind of the little bright-eyed son at his side the memory of his father's home across the Atlantic and the cruelties and oppression their race has endured and make him on his bended knee swear that so long as life animates his bones, he will cherish old Ireland, the land of his fathers. And should the opportunity come, he will strike home to avenge her wrongs. Mm. Okay. So they, they didn't really calm down. <laughs> that was, no. That was, <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So in conclusion, yep. We have another slide here. Very good. In conclusion, immigration was a terribly difficult and brave undertaking. The Mississippi River was the frontier in the 1830s with few services or infrastructure in the region. The Irish men and women who wended their way to the Galena area between 1822 and 1860 made a huge and lasting impact on our communities. Here in Galena, people descended from all groups celebrate Irish heritage on St. Paddy's Day with all day parties and a parade that attracts thousands to Main Street. While we may not hear much of a brogue on the streets of Galena today, we are all proud of the contributions the Irish made to our little corner of paradise. We'd like to end our talk now with an Irish song called Kind Friends and Companions.
I think we have a slide change too. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> kind friends and companions, come join me in rhyme. Come raise up your voices in chorus with mine. Come raise up your voices, all grief to refrain. For oh, we may and might never all meet here again. So here's a health to the company and one to my lass. Let's drink and be merry, hold out of one glass. Let's drink and be merry, hold grief to refrain. For we may and might never all meet here again. Well, there's a help to the wee lass that I love so well. In style and in bearing, there is none can excel. She smiles on my countenance as she sits on my knee. In this world, there is no man as happy as me. So here's a health to the company and one to my last. Let's drink and be merry all out of one glass. Let's drink and be merry all grief to refrain. For we may and might never all meet here again. So here's a health to our ship lies at harbor, she is ready to dock. I wish her safe landing without any shock. And if ever I meet you by land or by sea, I will always remember your kindness to me. So here's a health to the company and one to my last. Let's drink and be merry all out of one glass. Let's drink and be merry all grief to refrain. For we may and might never all meet here again. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.